Wait, remember Growing Up Creepy? Produced by Discovery Kids, this unique and short-lived show is severely underappreciated. Growing Up Creepy aired from September 9th, 2006 to June 21st, 2008. In its nearly two years of runtime, it aired a total of 26 episodes in one season, or 52 individual segments. Despite love from fans and critics, and even winning an Emmy for animation, the series never continued past one season. The show stars Creepy, a young girl who was raised by bugs after she is abandoned as a baby. Its extremely unique dark visual tone is hard to come by in children's animation, but for something heavily influenced by creepy things, it's really engaging. It has a really unique style, interesting stories, really good music, and a fun and lovable cast of characters. The series is just as unique and unapologetic as Creepy herself, which makes it that much more authentic to her character who is so easy to become attached to. This one goes out to all the middle school emo phase kids out there because this representation is phenomenal. This was me from that phase, listening non-stop to the Veronica's hit song Untouched on my third generation iPod Nano. If you enjoy the video, you better subscribe. Come join in on this journey into the one-of-a-kind experience that is growing up creepy. And a special surprise with some of the creators of the show joining me on this episode. Lights, please. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringe Miss, where there's going to be brand new videos every single day from December 1st to December 25th. Hop aboard. Growing up creepy follows the day-to-day -day life of a young human girl named Creepella Creature. Creepy, for short. And I'm specifying that she's human because her parents, and entire family, are bugs. Her mother is a praying mantis. Her father is a mosquito. She has a gnat younger brother, a pill bug older brother, and plenty of insect aunts, uncles, and cousins to go around. It really does take a village or a colony in this circumstance. She was abandoned as a baby at the doorstep of Dweezwald Mansion, which was thought to be uninhabited, but is actually home to many different types of bugs. She is taken in and raised as their own. When she reached an age where she started getting curious about the world and other kids of her species, they decided to reintegrate her back into human society by enrolling her in school. Creepy attends Middlington Middle School, named after its ordinary nature, and other than being alternative, fits in pretty well. She has friends friends, Budge and Chris Alice. And although her weirdness is subject to judgment from a few of her classmates, her confidence in herself gives her the air of authority that she needs to be herself. Each episode follows a new adventure in Creepy's life, whether it's participating in a social event, helping her friends, or keeping her home life a secret. Gee, Creepy, where'd you learn so much about bugs? Well, hi, I'm Creepy. Discovery Kids is back! Creepy herself is such a fun and lovable main character. She is voiced by Athena Karkinis. Creepy's much smaller than her peers, and paired with her huge eyes, she does have that stature of a bug. She also makes this specific little sound when she walks, like a cartoon bug would. Her hair is multicolored, and the half-up, half-down mini pigtails on top of her head resemble antennas. Although she's very colorful, she also has a very dark and gothic appearance. Her black dress that curls out at the bottom, purple striped sleeves and pants, like she's straight out of a Tim Burton movie. Her attitude is relaxed, but she is very vocal about the things she likes, and especially the things that she doesn't, frequently using the phrase, wicked. wicked. She's not afraid to give her seal of approval to the things that she likes. I one day hope that someone describes me as wicked. Creepy doesn't give power to any of the negative attention given to her from her peers, like frenemies Carla and Melanie. She is so comfortable in who she is that she actually finds Carla and Melanie to be the weird ones. Instead of changing herself to fit into the norm, she navigates the world unapologetically, which is pretty incredible considering she's in middle school. Middle school is usually where insecurity is born in Bread, which is probably where you get characters like Carla and Melanie. But another thing that I find really cool about Creepy's character is that she doesn't let her confidence in herself reflect as judgment on others. There's a bit of suspense in the fact that she has to keep her home life a secret from most people in her town. She has to prove to her teachers and the adult humans in the community that she is living in an enriching and attentive environment, or else she risks being taken away from her insect family and thrown into the foster care system. Chris Alice, voiced by Lara 
Renee, is Creepy's friend whose relationship causes some tension in the series. She is very different from Creepy, but they both complement each other pretty well. She's much more preppy and is very academically focused. Personality-wise, she's organized and loves getting involved in her middle school. As a very extroverted person, she makes an effort to get to know Creepy, although she does think that she is strange to an extent. But she doesn't let that change her respect for her. The tension between the two of them comes from Chris Alice's father, the local exterminator. Creepy has to be cautious with their friendship and keep her home life a secret from Chris Alice specifically, or risk having her whole family either driven out of their home at best, or killed at worst. Budge, on the other hand, is the only one that Creepy has told her secret to. Voiced by Richard Yearwood, Budge is Creepy's very large classmate. He's a classic gentle giant figure who was a fantastic friend to Creepy. He is always willing to help her with anything. He not only keeps her secret religiously, but also goes out of his way to make sure that no one else finds out. He also bonds with Creepy over their mutual love for the study of insects. His love for scientific study allows him to flex his high intelligence frequently. They both could could not look visually more different, but their personalities just fit so well together. Creepy's mother, Carolina, is voiced by Julie Lemieux. In the revised Bible for the series, she's described as Angelina Jolie, but in praying mantis form. She's described as sultry and strong, and she does portray all of those qualities. She is essential in making sure her house is kept in good condition, and the thousands of bugs that live in there are taken care of. Vinny, Creepy's father, is voiced by Dwayne Hill. In the Bible, he is compared to a van Empire, Creepy is incredibly close with her parents and despite needing to keep her home life a secret, talks about her parents and siblings quite a lot. If there was really a girl with bug parents, wouldn't she like have her own television show? Discovery Kids will be back. Discovery Kids is back. The series was co-created by three people, Anthony God, Chris Woods, and Karen Greenberg. I had the pleasure of getting to sit down with both Anthony and Karen to speak about the show further, really dig into what this show was. The idea for the show originally came from both Anthony and Chris initially. Excited to talk about Creepy. It's funny, I haven't talked about this show in a long time. This show started out as an idea about what would happen if somebody was a little bit different trying to make it in today's world, which is, I'm sure a lot of people can sort of relate to that, right? So it was it was coming from a place of not wanting to be conformist, right? So, so and I can only speak to myself, but I would imagine Karen would share some of what I'm saying. And originally it wasn't actually a girl raised by a family of bugs. We were trying to figure out a whole bunch of different ways that you could be an outsider. And the girl with the family of bugs actually was the one that that just felt natural to us. You remember Chris Woods, Karen? Of Chris course. did an incredible drawing. I like to go back to the moment I first saw this property. I came on this project. So so Anthony and Chris had developed the idea. They had written a Bible. I guess you pitched it around and you hadn't gotten traction at that point. And I remember my agent set me up. He said, you know, we have a meeting. We might need to meet one of our other clients. They have a bunch of kids ideas, you know, maybe see if there's anything they're, they're developing that you might be interested in working with them on. So I walk into the room and there were a bunch of there are pieces of artwork for different shows on the ta table in the conference room. And I looked down and I saw this and I literally got tingles down my back. I just saw that multicolored hair, the goggles, that look on her face, the multicolored clothing. I literally got chills. And and chills are how I know when something is good. Like, and when I, when I get chills about a project, I just have to work on it. So I literally pointed down at the table at this picture and I said, I want to work on that. So the first pitch was to a guy named Jim Rapsis, who was the oh, head yeah. of development at the Discovery Kids Network. I saw Jim Rapsis pick up the phone and speak very quietly and then hang up the phone. So that was kind of in the middle of our pitch. I didn't know what was happening. After the pitch was done, uh, Jim, who was the guy who picked up the phone, he said, we've been looking for a bug show. We wanted a show with a family. This is exactly what we're looking for. And he almost immediately started talking about, here's how we could do a deal. But he really, really liked the show. And the phone call was, um, I guess he called his boss, who was the head of the, of the Kids Network and said, I think I have something here you're going to really like. Uh, we then found Mike Young Productions, mm -hmm. who I had been working with on my previous show, Todd World, 
on another Discovery show. I called Josh Fisher, who's the head of development there at the time. I was like, I think we just sold the show. He said, why don't you bring it to us? You know, this is not what the show ended up looking like, you know, for anyone who's watched the show. So. Uh, so Jim, you know, Jim was a terrific executive. He gave us the greatest feedback and he pushed us to take the show. You know, we are, I, this show, even though it's got an edge to this look, there's also a kind of sweetness and, a, and it looks a little younger. You know, I would call this a four to seven, like a bridge show, not a preschool show, but definitely not a tween show, a six to 11 show. So Jim kind of pushed us to go in a darker goth kind of visual style. And then that's how we ended up with this look. So, you know, under Jim's direction and with the art direction of our director, a guy named Guy Vasilovich, we ended up evolving into this kind of dark, edgy, creepy kind of look and feel. Chris and I used to be toy designers. We worked for Hasbro before this. We had actually approached it like in the, we actually didn't create a TV show as much as we created a toy line and then wrote a story with Karen on it. Ah, with bugs. Like Right. So we said, well, how do we approach that's we're going to sell merchandise because merchandise is one of the big incentives for a lot of companies, at least back in the t back in that day. So many of these things that that we designed as as sort of the enticement for someone to want to buy the show, and we then started doing 3D tests to see if the show uh, would work in 3D. I had just done a whole bunch of 3D shows. I'd done reboot, Beast Wars, War Planets, and we did the test, and she lost. Like those drawings have a charm in them that the 3D just could. Do. The series art is extremely unique and visually tends to use a bug's perspective most of the time. It adopts a very gothic tone that stays true to the concept of the series. It uses traditional aesthetics like cobwebs, thorns, grungy textures, insects, and also a darker mysterious palette with dark purples, grays, and blacks. In addition, it tips its hat at the scene subculture with incorporations of colorful neons that are also used tastefully. Originally, the series was supposed to look very different, but had to adapt for the expenses and limitations of 2D animation. You have to be able to emotionally sell the image and you don't have a lot of time to do it. The strongest thing you could do is to eliminate anything you don't immediately need to whatever. If you could show one image and here it is, that almost always works. So if you think about it from another, like Iron Man before, if you didn't know Marvel, it's iconic look right? Stormtroopers, anything that, even someone holding a lightsaber, before you saw any of these things, if you saw somebody holding a lightsaber, you're like, oh my God, what is it? I gotta know more. I think something that keeps me fresh, you know, over 30 years of, you know, developing and writing and story editing kids shows is I don't necessarily turn to something that has existed before. Like for me, initially it was the artwork and then it was the concept itself. Like, what would it be like to be a kid raised by insects? Like for me, I, I tried to just draw inspiration from the world of insects. So honestly, I didn't really reference anything that I'd read or watched. It was more like, you know, doing research on insects, you know, I, and, and actually I tell this story a lot. I did a lot of research on cockroaches. I learned a lot. I call it the mighty cockroach. The mighty cockroach has been around for like over 200 million years. It's, you know, the dinosaurs came and went, lots of other species came and went. The cockroach has survived where every everyone else died out. And why? Well, first of all, it can go without food for 45 days. It can go without water for a week. It can live without its head for a week. And the only reason it dies is that without its head, it can't drink water. It's able to hunker down when times are tough. And sometimes when times are tough with me, I, I draw inspiration from the mighty cockroach. And I, you know, I tell this story to other people who might need inspiration. I kind of, so it's really for me, the inspiration from the world of insects. Learn, I learned about termites. In the, don't read about termites while you're eating your lunch at your desk. Those <laughs> notes that you read became part of the show. Oh yeah, you know, that inspired the storylines, first of all, creatively. And then we also have what we call bug bites, B-Y-T-E-S. At the end of every episode, I think it was just a little short interstitial segment that picked up on one of the bug facts that inspired the creative part of the story. And then we had one of our writers, Lori Israel, who I have worked with for many years. She's very talented. She started out on the show writing all the bug bites. And then later she and her uh, writing partner, Rachel Rudderman, wrote a bunch of episodes for Creepy. When night falls, out come the scorpions. Beware the night crawlers. But you know, every story, even though it was a, you know, ultimately a human story or an emotional story where Creepy was dealing with some 
something was inspired by something from the bug world. So I would say it was actually entomology that inspired the show. What's interesting, we, we I kind of operate the same way. We weren't really inspired by anything. I think the reason that all our initial shows did well, Reboot included and Beast Wars and and, and War, Pl War Planets, I, we didn't have inspiration from anything. We just worked from a core idea. And I think that was really the kind of idea that, that what made all of them work, right? Like we did a show called Dragon Booster that was like, what would happen if, you know, you combine the Fast and the Furious and Jurassic Park? So you always kind of work with these sort of themes and then you really don't want any inspiration uh, because you want to create as something as original as you can. And I think when you look for inspiration, you subconsciously start to move one way or the other and become a genre. So, you know, we always intentionally avoided uh, trying to get inspiration from external sources to, to create the most original thing we could. I did mention earlier that the series reception was very positive and even won an Emmy, and at one point was picked up by Nickelodeon internationally. On that note, why did the series only get the 26 episodes that it had? The answer lies with the Discovery Kids network itself. Discovery Kids, we'll be back. Discovery Kids is back. Discovery Kids as a, as a network went away during the show, right? The show was very popular. People liked it. And it was ultimately picked up by Nickelodeon in South America, right? Oh, uh, yeah, right. It did air on Nick International, right? And internationally, right. And, and so when Discovery went out of business, that's when we lost the ability to uh, sell the show again. And there has been interest in redoing it or starting it over or continuing it. Because it, actually today it would probably be more appealing than it was when we created it. Uh, those distribution rights got tied up. But I, you know, I spoke with Mike Young about six months ago, just completely randomly on this topic. And he thinks the rights are going to revert back to Mike Young. Theoretically, she could be revived. One of the greatest moments I've, I think I've ever had, well, I went to a Comic-Con and somebody was dressed as creepy. And I actually didn't believe it at first. I thought it was like Harley Quinn or something. And my wife's like, no, look at her stockings. It's creepy. And it was creepy. And I've, I don't think I've ever seen that before. I mean, I've seen the Transformers and stuff and I've seen some of the other stuff, but creepy was different for us. I once spoke at NYU to some grad students from the Tisch School who were all, you know, aspiring to go into professional writing. After the event, um, you know, a girl, she was probably in her early to mid twenties and she had some different colors in her hair. And she came up to me and she said, I just wanted you to know that when I was a kid, I watched Growing Up Creepy and it totally inspired me. And the fact that she was unapologetically different, you know, she said like that totally inspired me. It's something I carry with me. That made me feel so good. Our show was a little more indie <laughs> than some of the shows that you might have seen on Nickelodeon or Disney, where they had a much wider uh, reach in terms of audience. Uh, it's a, it was a boutique -y kind of show. <laughs> the thing about this show that work is good as well as the music, the concept, and the art was the music. I actually think that this is the best soundtrack of any show I've ever worked on. If you've heard Samantha Lombardi's music, the, the, the theme song, and just all her work in general, but all the, do you remember the, when Creepy goes on a date in the amusement park, Karen? That song, like I still play it. The music from Creepy and that artist Sam Lombardi, it was it was original to take a sophisticated, really not even, not really a kid sound and put it in a show, which I think more shows should do, but I love the music of, of that show. So the future of Growing Up Creepy may just exist. She may have a future, whether it's in the form of a reboot or revival or spin-off show. It could be possible. Creepy may be done growing up, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't have more stories to tell. I do think there is a space for something like a growing up creepy, maybe even a spiritual successor to growing up creepy, you know, maybe called where now creepy's and she is <laughs> Yeah, you know, something something that can evolve it beyond the original, you know, uh, IP. Great idea. My takeaway from all of this is that I will reach out to the appropriate people and see if we can do something about it. I think today's day and age, Karen, with, with if we were to do this on something like the <laughs> channel, we'd have a lot more ability to do the stories that we wanted to do without interference. Yeah. Take it a little further, you know? Yeah. A little further. I, like, I love <laughs> Funny enough, a week after recording this interview and making some comments about the show coming back as well as the rights to the show, they were able to secure the rights back to the show. And if you'd like to see this show come back in some shape or form down the road, let us know in the comments. I for one am very excited at the fact that it's now a reality for that possibility. 
Thank you guys so much. Is there anywhere that uh, people can follow you to keep up with your work? I created a show early during the pandemic. Um, it's on YouTube. It's called Quarantine the Musical. And I did it. I didn't make any money from it. I just did. It was another passion project, but it was about three kids who were supposed to be in their school musical, which got canceled. So they ended up doing a musical online. So I like to drive traffic to that. It's free. It's on YouTube and- uh, It'll be linked down below. Me, I, I'm in the video game world again. I, I, I do a lot of, of public speaking and stuff. I, I started to go back and talk about these kind of older shows, like you mentioned earlier, Transformers and, and um, Reboot. But um, most of my stuff is at g3esports.gg. So you can see what my company's doing. We're heavily in the esports space. I'm having a lot of fun. It's the toughest thing I've ever done by a long shot. Once we've we've kind of established these this new startup, I have thought about Karen getting back into this for fun, right? So let's see what we can do in a few years. But um, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> this was such a fun and special video to work on, and I am grateful to both Anthony and Karen being involved here as well as a huge special shout out to Christine, who works extremely close with me on a lot of projects, and I couldn't have done this without her. But also, thanks to you for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.